Hi everyone, I'm Mia Saini Dachnowski and I'm one of the entrepreneur in residences here at the University of Chicago and I'm excited to do a deep dive into Pitching 101. A little bit about me, I am the co-founder and former CEO of Ores and Alps. It's a premium skincare brand for guys that lead this very active on-the-go lifestyle. We started in 2016 as a direct-to-consumer site and have since expanded an omni-channel presence in Target, Dick's Sporting Good, and Macy's. I am currently on the board of the company, and I also do a lot of angel investing. And so in that capacity, I see a lot of pitch decks and I have a good sense of what works and what doesn't work. My area of expertise is specifically in the consumer space. And in terms of functionality, I really love helping companies think about ideation to putting it on paper and capturing that idea. And I also like to focus on honing into the operation side of the business. So with that, what's the point of the pitch deck? Really the pitch deck is to take that idea that you've been spending hours days, maybe months thinking about, it's been percolating in your mind, and you want to capture that into a 15 to 20 slide deck. And the deck essentially is what you're putting forth in front of an investor. And what's so important to highlight in this pitch deck is essentially why it's an exciting and exceptional investment opportunity right now, why you're the right team to launch it, and what's the growth potential? And I'll specify that the growth potential is really important because different investors, well, they have different ideas of what good growth is, right? So if you talk to a typical VC, they may say to you, well, look, I'm looking for 10X, but perhaps an age old investor or a family office doesn't have that type of typical return profile or, or growth profile. So it's important to think about that when you're compiling this stack. But ultimately you wanna take that idea and put it together in this stack and you wanna really figure out what you actually want from the investor as well. And so I'm gonna walk you through how to put together your typical pitch deck if it's your first time you know, going to, to do something like this. So I'll say that it's actually gonna be one of many pitch decks you'll put together. There are really kind of three big pitch decks. The first is that full deck. So think of this as that big meaty deck. You're going to send it to really serious investors who have a vetted interest or who have asked for more information on what you're doing. You're gonna digitally send this. And I usually tell the entrepreneurs that I'm talking to to you know, get a DocSend account and send it digitally. And the nice thing about that is you'll be able to track what page the investors are spending time on, and that could be useful to you. And you also get a good sense of who actually is getting the deck. Now, that said, often these decks get into lots of different people's hands. So keep that in mind when you're creating your content and pulling together your information uh, that may be more confidential or sensitive. Uh, so that's the first deck. The second deck is called the primer deck. You may have referred to it or heard it referred to as the teaser deck. And that teaser deck is really maybe like four or five slides. And the whole point of this is to get that initial person, whether it's an investor or an employee or a potential vendor, excited. You want to whet their appetite, so to speak. And that's what you're going to do with this primer deck. Um, it's going to be pretty much light on the details and heavy on the narrative and heavy on that big idea of what you're looking to do. The last deck that most uh, entrepreneurs have is that presentation deck. And think of the presentation deck as the one that you're actually going to go in front of a bunch of people and present. So not too dissimilar than what I am doing now. And this deck is going to be really focused on the big ideas and the narrative. And it's going to not have that too many words, too many details, too many charts. You don't really want all of that. Um, you'll usually do this type of deck if you're a part of a pitch competition or accelerator program. So think of that as um, that where that deck would come into play. So the first page in your deck, I always say, I want to know what your company is. So I want to know your logo. I want to know the date. I want to know uh, the name of your company. And you can also put a disclaimer here. You can put a confidentiality statement, as you can see in the one example that I have. Throughout this presentation, you're going to see bits and pieces of the Ores and Alps initial decks that we put together, just so you can get a sense of what something like this would look like. Right after that, I like to keep the narrative really tight and to really suck the potential investor into the next few pages. And I really like when I see a uh, mission statement or a motto. Some people put an executive summary and you can see the one here uh, is the one that Ors and Alps had. We also put our hashtag, which was take to the Ors. Again, you want to bring the person in and this should be a visual slide accompanied by the text that you're going to have. 
Then quickly, you need to get to the nut of the problem. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Why is it a big deal right now? And that's the important part, that now piece, because a problem can be a problem, but why does it need to be fixed right now? And the way you're gonna address this slide is by data. So I like to see what customers' pain points are. I also like to know why current solutions are not up to par. And the best way you can show me this is by say, hey, look, I've talked to 100 customers, or I'm actually in the middle of a beta right now, and 80% of customers have identified this as a problem. And that's gonna be really helpful in convincing a potential investor that this is an actual problem is with that data. So you've got that problem slide, now you've got to go to the solution. And the solution is how you're planning on solving that problem. And it has to really obtain two important things. You need to show me why that solution is going to, number one, win. And number two, why it's scalable. And that's really important because as you can imagine that as a, an investor, we see lots of these. We see lots of problems and solutions, but the solution needs to be something that's super scalable. And when I say scalable, that means as few dollars to get as much growth, which is revenue as possible. Again, data show me this. If you've got beta results, you've got surveys, customer interviews, put all of that here to bolster the fact that your solution is the right one to address the problem. So again, you can imagine that investors, well, we get bombarded with a lot of decks and often the decks are the same idea. It all comes down to execution. You've heard that several times, execution, execution, execution. And who was going to execute the idea? Well, it's the team. And I always call it affectionately the dream team. So you've got the, you got the, the 92 um, basketball team right here the dream team, so to speak. I wanna know who they are, their bio, perhaps their school, relevant experience. I would like to see photos, it's really important, so I can put a picture with the name. And then more importantly, I wanna know that you were able to convince these potential people who are part of the founding team to quit their jobs, to join you, to take a bet on you. Again, that's so important. Not only that, but were there advisors or board of directors that you were able to convince to quit you know, not just quit, but like to invest their time and energy into you. Uh, I often get questions on like, you know, do you have to give equity to some of these advisors and board of directors? And I'd say most typically the arrangement is between 0.5 and 1%, but we can talk a little bit about what that looks like uh, later on. But that's really where I find um, the most value comes from is what's that whole dream team? Because everyone knows it's a very lonely journey and you really need to assemble the right people because when things go south, and they always do, you wanna make sure you have a great sounding board of different people and perspectives and opinions who are really able to help you and lift you up, but most importantly, lift that business up. Okay, market size. I know for a fact, just by looking at docs and data, that this is a slide that investors spend a lot of time looking at. This plus the financials is where you will see investors spend a lot of time. So I wanna make sure you get this right. A market size is essentially an exercise where you tell the potential investor, how big is your idea? How big of a market is this? And it's a bottoms up analysis. And there are three components. The first component is the total addressable market. And that's the total market for your product. Then it's the serviceable available market. You can also hear it say as the serviceable addressable market. And that's your SAM. And that's the portion of the market that you can acquire based on your strategy. Lastly, it's a serviceable obtainable market or the SOM, and that's the percentage of the SAM, but like, let's face it, that you can realistically and actually capture and obtain. I always tell people, if I see this slide and it's not heavily asterisked, that means something is wrong. I want to see where you're getting your TAM from. Most often your TAM is from an industry report that says, you know, what the size of the market is. I then want to see an asterisk that tells me the assumption of how you went from your TAM to your SAM, but perhaps the most important assumption on this page will be the one that you went from SAM to SOM. As an investor, I know that there's a lot of data out there, that the idea has probably been out there, but I also wanna know like how smart of a CEO or co-founder or an operator are you? And one way I can do that is by seeing how sound and judicious your assumptions are. Uh, and so that's why it's important for this slide to be heavily asterisked and to really have a good sense of how to create this. I know there are a lot of resources on how to create this analysis, but this is the place where this would go. So the next slide that's super important is your customer. 
I want to know that you know who your customer is, but actually most importantly, I want to know that you know who your customer isn't. So by way of example, one of the things that Oars and Alps did initially is we hired an ethnographer and this person literally went into people's bathrooms and looked at the shampoo they were using and their moisturizer and their serums and to understand what were they using, how were they using, what brands they were using, and why were they using them. And we identified four different archetypes. We identified a whatever Walter who was using Irish Spring and didn't really care, spent no money on their skincare, a people pleaser Perry, and that person was a person that was kind of pleasing their significant other and would just use or buy whatever that person said. Uh, we identified an aesthetic Andrew, who quite frankly had better skincare than I did and was willing to spend hundreds of dollars on their skincare regimen. And then lastly, we identified a Diligent Dave. And Diligent Dave would you know, read men's health or look at periodicals and do his information, talk to dermatologists, and was very well researched. And it was important for us to divide our customers into these four different archetypes because we quickly realized that whatever Walter and aesthetic Andrew weren't our target customers, and that made sense to us because then we knew that we didn't have to use our marketing dollars to try to attract people who actually weren't going to spend with us. And so we spent all of our time looking at the other two categories. And so I always tell people uh, to do this analysis. This will evolve over time. These archetypes aren't always the ones that we are now referring to at or as an Alps, but it is important to get a good sense of who your customer is and again, who your customer isn't. So competition. I love to see the side visually. Most often I see it as that typical white space chart and I love seeing that. Again, as an investor, I wanna know the assumptions you're making. So I'm gonna look very carefully to see how you define your axes. So the X axis and the Y axis, I'm gonna to look to see what you used um, to decide the parameters for how you're going to space out everyone. Ideally, at the end, you come to the conclusion that there's this big white space and that's where your company is going to dominate. Go to market strategy, a really important slide, um, which essentially tells me how are you going to launch initially? How will you know if you're actually successful? And is there any data if you currently have on any of this, whether it's sales or marketing data? I essentially want to know that you know how you're going to target your core demographic. It's really important that at the end of the day, when I look at the slide, you're not telling me that you're going to like bet the farm on, you know, influencers or just throwing all your money into marketing because I'm telling you right now, that's not going to be a sustainable strategy. But when you're able to show me that you have a very solid go to market strategy, uh, then I become excited. And if you've showed me already traction in that, then the idea gets even more exciting. Product. So whether you're a B2B or um, a consumer company, you're going to have a roadmap of whether it's, you know, an app functionality or a tech functionality or in a consumer's case, in the actual product, maybe it's a rollout of distribution. You want to show me kind of what you're working on. So here's an example of the three new fragrances that Oris and Alps is going to roll out back in 2018. And so it gives you a good sense. Again, visually showing me is really important here. Okay, so this is the other slide on the business model where investors are going to spend a lot of time. And it's an important slide because it essentially says to me how you're going to make money. And the way you would do this would be in your typical unit economics analysis. The unit economics is important because it essentially shows me by um, you showing me the calculations of all the, the revenues and all your costs that there's a contribution margin that's healthy and that you think you can sustain and that you can essentially grow. So metrics that you would also show me here is your average order volume, typical shipping fees, the LTV, which is um, super important, um, which is the lifetime value. So how much value are you going to extract from a customer? And then your CAC, which stands for your customer acquisition cost. So how much does it cost to procure that customer? And essentially, you want to be paid back um, pretty quickly uh, from that initial uh, cost. And so business model, super, super important. Followed by a, another very important slide, and this is your financial forecasts. I typically like to see on this slide a screenshot of your five-year financial forecast. And I always tell entrepreneurs I talk to to have an aggressive version and a conservative version. Again, you got to really read the investor. You're going to have a pitch deck pretty much for every investor. And you may have, you know, maybe one that you think you're going to send to more of your conservative ones and more to your aggressive ones. But again, as an 
investor, I look at the assumptions and I want to know, like, does this guy actually really think, or this woman really think this is going to happen? And, you know, error. and that's super important when you, when you think about putting together your forecast, uh, often one piece of feedback or pushback I always get is, Hey Mia, five years, like a lot can happen. Like COVID happens, pandemics happen. How do I think about forecasting? Can I do a three-year one also? And I always say, yeah, go ahead and put together a three-year, have that in your back pocket. Uh, the five-year one, again, allows you to make a little bit more assumptions, but a three-year one is also totally okay. At the end of the day, you probably will get a good sense of um, what your potential investor wants. And you can even ask if you're about to go into that meeting. That could be a great follow-up question, which is, you know, hey, um, what kind of forecast do you want to see? Do you want to see a three-year one or five-year one? Um, I'll probably tell you both. <laughs> Okay, lastly, I like to see a traction chart uh, or tra traction slide. This is a little bit different than the go to market, especially if you are pre launch and you're putting together this type of deck for your first raise. Uh, and this shows me what milestones you have already achieved, whether it's sales or customers, maybe it's distribution deals, it could also be websites, conversions. Or maybe just as simple as, look, hey, we, we just launched and we already have, you know, 10,000 Twitter followers or Instagram followers, just giving me a sense of where you're at. And if, you know, the Bloomberg wrote about you, I want to know about that now. So these are the milestones you've already achieved. The next slide should show me the milestones you're planning to achieve. So I call this pathways to success. And this slide is really focused on what do you think you can actually do with a timestamp next to it? So it could be sales related, product pipeline. Are you about to go into another phase of iterative testing through another beta? Is there gonna be a pre-launch happening? Just anything that can tell me what you're expecting to do and those milestones that are important for you to hit. Lastly, the capital raise. That's why you're giving me this deck, right? In the first place, you need cash to grow this business. And so I want to know how much you've raised, how are you raising it, how long is it going to take you, and the use of capital. I'll spend a moment talking about that use of capital because it's really important to delineate exactly how you're going to use that capital. I like to see it in a pie chart or at least broken down by percentages. Uh, so if you're raising $2 million and you're telling me you're going to use 1.5 of it for marketing, I'm going to think, oh, there's a problem here. Uh, I like to see no more than, you know, half of it going towards something like marketing. And then I really want to see it specified and explained how and why and how experimental it's going to be versus solid results in terms of gaining some traction or some actual revenue. So I like to see people say, you know, we're going to take $500,000 and it's going to, we're going to be able to have five employees that are going to get paid this much on an annual basis. And really going into that detail is important. It's also uh, helpful to me if I do give you a check, because when you come back to me to top you off for a future round, perhaps I'm going to go back and say, well, I, we, you know, you raised around recently. Did you use all of that money appropriately or how you told me you were going to raise it? And so having that use of capital is really important. This slide is going to be very much dictated by keeping in mind who your audience is. So uh, that's pretty much the meat of the deck. There are also various appendix slides. So these slides, depending on how important it is perhaps to you or your company or the nature of your business, you may want to move up to the quote unquote meat part of it. But these are slides that I've seen that people have had in their quote unquote, proverbial back pockets so that if an investor says, well, hey, um, what partnerships have you done? You can say, well, actually, you know, I've got that slide and you can move towards it. So slides that I've seen in appendix slides in the past include customer testimonials pages. So a page that says all the great things customers are saying about you, a press page, a social media grid, website mockups, NPS scores. So that's your net promoter score. Financial assumptions, super, super important. You're going to need that for your market sizing. You're going to need it for your forecast. You're going to need that for your unit economics. Uh, if it's a heavy M&A period, I'd love seeing, you know, here's some recent big, flashy, great exits, you know, uh, in this specific industry that you're in. Uh, customer funnels and journeys. Once you get that customer, what do they go through before they actually kind of make that sale once you hook them, hook on a potential customer? Uh, your vendor list, it just shows that you understand that, you know, that you need an accountant and a lawyer. And if there's a, an accelerator backing, you put all of that information here. Uh, the partnership page, as I mentioned, is also a big one. At Ors and Alps, the partnership page was very much central to the core of our, our deck because we had some flashy um, partnerships with things like Nike and Peloton, and we wanted to make sure that we were showcasing that. So again, hopefully this is helpful in terms of helping you understand how to put together a pitch deck. It's going to evolve over time, but the most important thing to keep in mind is to constantly 
update it and make sure it's targeted towards the right person in terms of the right audience. And feel free to move the slides around based off of the narrative that you're looking to tell, but also that you're looking to achieve. But I would encourage you to make sure that that problem and that solution and that team slide are up front in the beginning, because especially if you're a first time founder, it's really important to understand um, why you're the right team to solve the problem and why your solution's the best. So with that, best of luck to you.